Thank you so much, Vedika, for joining me on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time now. And, uh, you know, you're, you're obviously, I've done my research and I'm very familiar with your chief of staff and investor at the Weekend Fund. Prior to that, you have some experience with some startups and a very interesting story. Uh, would love for, for those who, you know, aren't as familiar, if you could just sort of tell your story from uh, as early as you're willing to start, really. Uh, I like to hear about sort of the, the origin story to, uh, to where you are today. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me, Drake. Um, I'm really happy to be here. So, um, yeah, let me take you all of the way, all the way back. So I actually grew up in South India in Bangalore and, um, I had a very free childhood. So, um, my brother Vara and I were close in age. Um, and we also had a dog who was roughly the same age as ours. Um, so we had like this team situation, but our like parents, uh, traveled a lot, uh, pre high school. And that meant like my brother and I had a lot of freedom. And what we decided to do with this freedom was basically just like spend our time on whatever captured our curiosity. So, um, let me give you, let me give you some examples. Um, we lived in this like duplex apartment situation and there was like an office, underneath us and the office got burglarized. So it got like broken into and we decided, I remember to actually investigate that crime. Um, we used to organize like hide and seek um, games for like our entire neighborhood. Lots of coordination involved, like a bunch of kids um, playing hide and seek, like basically anywhere in the neighborhood. We take our dog to school um, on the drive to school and back because why not? We do we lost this dog many times and found him many times. Um, and yeah, we had like an unusually high amount of like freedom in our lives growing up. Um, and there's definitely some upsides to that and some downsides. I think the op like the main upside was um, every time we had a problem, like the default was to like solve it ourselves, um, at least in like the early years, because our parents weren't like they were gone for like, you know, a week at a time um, or maybe even longer than that. And the downside was like we had very little routine. Like I don't ever remember having like a bad time, uh, for example. And I like admittedly still struggle with that uh, to this day. Like I, I stay up way too late uh, all the time. Um, and my, um, my parents run a family business. So uh, my grandpa, he started a flour mill. Uh, in South India, having dropped out of school in the fifth grade. And then he ended up becoming like a wheat broker in the market and eventually um, built one of the largest flour mills, uh, flour mill groups um, in South India. So we definitely had like that backdrop um, of, of a family business. And we'd have like conversations related to the business um, at the dinner table. Uh, but when I was 17, um, I was lucky enough to go to university in California. So this was at Berkeley. And um, I showed up a week, uh, the week after orientation. So like that was like the, you know, like the first welcome week of classes. And the reason I showed up a bit late was because it was like a massive negotiation process with my parents back home because they were paying for me to go to university in the US, which is not easy at all because my parents were like earning in rupees and paying in dollars. But anyway, I finally like show up and I was like in the science and engineering dor dorm at Berkeley and it was wild. Like, I just remember like I was like overhearing conversations and having conversations with like other 17 and 18 year olds who wanted to like, they were saying like build parts of the future. And I was just like, I have no idea like what that even means, but like, I want to be like, I want to be a part of that. And ended up doing like a whole bunch of internships in tech. Um, the last of these internships, I like cold, my, cold emailed my way into, it was a venture capital internship at a late stage fund called Mithril Capital. Uh, this is like associated with like the, like the Peter Thiel umbrella. And I was an intern for my last semester of college. And I remember like sitting there and founder pitches and thinking like, how could this possibly be a job? Like, how can you get paid to hear other people talk about the future? 
Um, and I finished the internship. Um, I joined Stripe. Um, this was in 2015. I was on the risk team at Stripe. Um, the team had like a very interesting setup. So it was 20 people, half engineering, half non-engineering. And at the time, I think there were managing risks for about $20 billion in payment volume globally. And no one on the team like actually had any meaningful risk experience. Um, and then I ended up losing the H-1B visa lottery um, I ended up taking a year off um, instead of moving to Stripe's London office and went back to India, spent time with my parents, my grandparents, aunts and uncles, um, and then went to Berlin that summer uh, to learn how to code. Um, it was one of these coding boot camps. Um, I realized it takes way longer than nine weeks to actually learn how to code. And after that summer, I joined a fintech startup here in London called Shoelayer. Uh, TrueLayer is basically trying to build the plaid of Europe. I was the fifth or sixth person to join the team, um, end up being the first product manager there. And when I was leaving a year and a half later, we were a hundred people um, and they doubled in the two years um, after that as well. So learned a lot about how like tech startups actually scale. And that brings me to my current job at Weekend Fund. Um, I mean, we can talk about this like a bit more if you're curious, but I remembered how energizing it was to work at Mithril in that in that investing internship I talked about. Um, but I, I was interviewing with venture capital funds and honestly, like they weren't really going anywhere. It felt like the best position I could get like was like an associate uh, position, which which wouldn't have been bad at all, but I did want to like meaningfully work with founders, especially because like I had a product background and that's where I thought my strengths lied. Um, so I decided to start writing these fantasy investment memos and how these worked were every time I saw like a funding announcement on TechCrunch or like a portfolio page of a fund that I looked up to. Like, so Union Square Ventures is a good example because they publish investment memos. Uh, A16Z publishes like an investment summary. Uh, but yeah, funds like that who actually announce um, a lot of their investments and some of their reasoning behind that investment. And then I try to like reverse engineer the investment as if I had seen the deal. And one memo led to the next. Um, and when uh, my current boss, Ryan, Ryan was hiring for the chief of staff role at Weekend Fund, he actually reached out to um, a friend of mine, Harry Stubbings, for recommendations. And Harry just completely luckily recommended me for the role. Uh, he'd also, he like had read some of my memos and had like that context as well. And um, I ended up starting at Weekend Fund part-time. So this was nights and weekends, which is on brand for the fund because uh, we're called Weekend Fund. And six months in, um, I joined full-time and it's been uh, one and a half years uh, since that point. And it's honestly been the best job I've ever had. That's an awesome story. I, I appreciate you sharing. And you certainly went back far enough, as, as I yeah. like to hear, with the uh, the childhood stories of playing detective uh, for for what sounded like a real crime, and then and also <laughs> organizing the uh, the neighborhood hide and seek. And maybe that was a uh, you know a harbinger for for the organizational skills you'd later put in action today at, at Weekend Fund. Um, question from from the early days. Mm. You mentioned your parents have this. Uh, or at least had this this flour milling business. Mm. Was there any expectation uh, growing up that you would sort of fall into, uh, you know, uh, being the successor basically for for that business and keeping that business going? Yeah, I think there were always undertones of that expectation, um, as is the case with most family businesses. Um, but at the same time, my my dad about. Uh, 10 years into running the family business actually decided to take a two-year break and go get an MBA. And I think that really exposed him uh, to like, just like the value of like getting exposure to a world that is very far uh, from the family business. So 
I think Vara and I, Vara, there's my little brother. Um, he also works in tech. We just got really lucky that my dad and mom had had that experience when, like, you know, four or five years after they had the both of us. So they were like、oh, definitely open to the idea and like saw the value in us. Like before we even like made any of those decisions, that we actually kind of went out there like in the world and like had like a good feel. For what like the other options were, right? Yeah, that that makes sense, and, and certainly I'm sure that they are、uh, proud of where you guys have ended up, and <laughs> you know, hopefully the the business is still doing well back home. But it's nice to to branch out and、uh, get the exposure, like you said, and work on these different things in, in tech and otherwise.、Um, so you you go to Berkeley. You're I think 17 years old.、Mm. Is that your first time in America? What what was like the、uh, You know, was there a culture shock there? You mentioned sort of meeting all these people who want to sort sort of help build the future.、Mm. I'm curious to hear how that sort of experience was coming from a childhood in India, sort of comparing and contrasting what you were used to versus what you were sort of dropped into all of a sudden. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was definitely a culture shock.、Um, also, my parents didn't、um, drop me off at college, so like, I feel like even that, like, you know, those few initial weeks that your parents like spend dropping you off at school, which I understand now is like the norm, that really helps you like kind of cushion your transition, right? Like into this world. But I basically just like I rocked up and. Yeah, like I think I think my kind of initial impressions were just like the level of ambition was just completely different、uh, from what I was used to at home. And the second thing is, I didn't have like a lot of、um, like. I mean, my parents definitely like ran a business, but、um, I come from this community in India,、um, the Marwadi community, and increasingly a lot more women are like you know work. But、um, growing up, I just didn't have like that many like aunts or uncle. Ah,、uh, sorry, not uncles, or,、um, but I didn't have many aunts or like female family friends. Or people that I looked up to who actually like built a career, and then I was suddenly like surrounded by like other girls my age, and all of them had like ambitions to like build a career.、Um, so that was, I think, that was like really like validating in a way because that's like what I wanted、uh, for myself as well. But yeah, I like it was just a completely. Different world than the world that like I was exposed to back home. Yeah, I, I can imagine. And、uh, you said I, th- I think it was your first internship was with、uh, Mithril or or however you、mm. pronounce that the Myth,、uh, yeah. the VC firm.、Um, yeah. And so was that you know that's obviously you've you've sort of come full circle there now、yeah. being being in VC again after a couple of stints. Yeah. With startups was that、uh, something where basically. Like you identified that early as something you'd really be interested. You sort of mentioned like seeing these people,、um, mm. you know, reviewing pitches and being like, "How could you possibly get paid for <laughs> this?" Was that was that like your your dream job? Sort of once you sort of settled in at Berkeley and realized like what this world of tech was sort of all about. Yeah,、um, Mithril was actually my last internship. I'd done like a bunch of internships、uh, before that, but it was my first investing internship. And the way、um, Mithril came on my radar is because they posted a job posting for a principal role、um, on their investment team, and I remember this distinctly. They asked for like eleven to thirteen years of experience, and I had like negative six months of experience because I was six months from graduating from Berkeley, and I was like, well,、um, but also they had this other thing on the job posting. Uh, Mithril is all about building enduring businesses, and I come from like a family business background, right? Like that is the philosophy, like on un- like underlying a lot of family businesses. You want your businesses to endure from like one generation to the next, and like that message really resonated、uh, with-, with me because that's what I had heard like back home. But then, you know, these businesses were actually like tech enabled businesses, so I was like. Oh my god! Philosophically, I was like, "This is it," but now I just need to get them to like hire me, and、um, I must have emailed them like at least ten times, maybe more,、uh, 
Um, but I like literally had nothing to lose, right? Like just given how little experience I had. Um, yeah. And I ended up there. I remembered it being very energizing. Um, I just didn't have enough experience um, to say like, you know, this was like the thing I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I just didn't have like enough of like a sample, but we have like a very, I think all of us, we have like a very intuitive understanding of like, ah, this gives me energy or this takes away my energy or like in my downtime, I'm actually thinking about that pitch. And I had the same thing like happen full circle when I was a product manager at True Layer and then investing at Weekend Fund on the side, right? Like I was like in my like downtime, for example, between meetings, I would just find myself like automatically thinking about like a conversation we had with like a founder. And I think like, I, I've like over time, like started to get a bit more in tune uh, with myself and like look out for like those like signals from like inside of me. Yeah, I, I love a couple aspects of that uh, little, you know, little story. I think that uh, the first one is that just the sheer persistence and sort of boldness <laughs> of, of reaching out like 10 times. I am a huge proponent of the cold email. Many mm. of my guests come from cold emails. And uh, I just think it's a it's a very underrated sort of way to, uh, you know, get in touch with people you want to get in touch with. And of mm. course, you don't want to just like spam people. But if you have something interesting or worthwhile to say or offer then uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a great great channel that people don't really take advantage of and the persistence to do it 10 times I've, I've sort of I, I tend to level out at around three um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm curious uh, sort of what made you so you know what gave you such conviction to sort of go ahead and, and send that eighth and ninth and tenth <laughs> that, that's like the first thing uh, the second is uh, you talked about sort of the importance of having this sort of intuition about what gives you energy. Yeah. And um, I think that's, that, that's exactly the way I think about it. I think a lot of people somewhat synonymously talk about sort of do what you love or do what you're passionate about. Mm. Um, and I'm like, you know, not to say that I don't feel those things, but I'm not like a particularly enthusiastic person. I, I like, I function more on like, I would say energy is sort of a more familiar word for me. And mm. uh it's, it's really powerful, I think, to sort of realize, like you said, the things that add energy versus the things mm. that sort of suck energy and to spend as much time in the former as possible because the latter, eventually, it's, it's just probably not working to your advantage. So uh, maybe, you know, a little bit of a two-part question there, but mm. the first thing is like what, you know, gave you the conviction or, or was it just sheerly the recognition that you had <laughs> nothing to lose? Yeah. Uh, and then secondarily, um, I guess, w what are some things today that you think about as like being positive energy for you versus negative? Mm, yeah, those are really good questions. I think like, do you just remember being like 19 or 20 or 21 and just like, you're just so green that I think you almost don't even fully like understand yet, like what it feels to be rejected. Yeah, I, right? I, do, my I, I do my best to stay that way today. Yeah. I was just at that point, it just so happened that I was like just so early in my career. Um, and the second thing was, I just completely knew that like, ob obviously I was underqualified for the job, right? Like it, I wasn't surprised when they didn't get back to me. I was like, you know, I don't have like anywhere close to like what they need for this principal level job. So like what I'm asking them for is like basically, you know, to accept me for like an internship, which is like a completely different thing that they haven't even like advertised. I did later learn actually, and I didn't even realize this, I think in my interview process with them, which actually lasted six months, which is like a different, like it was like a semester long internship, uh, sorry, interview process for a semester long internship. But I did later learn that they did have like an internship program um, that had a lot of students from uh, the University of Waterloo that has a co-op program. And that like also completely opened up my, um, just opened up my like, understanding of like co-op programs and how valuable it is to actually like uh, work 
alongside studying if you possibly can. I made that happen because I just like finished classes early at Berkeley, but like couldn't graduate because of like visa stuff. I wanted to spend my one year visa extension when I actually had a full-time job. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of programs now out in the world. And if I had to like choose choose uni- like which university to go to again, I would definitely optimize for a university that has like a work alongside studying or like co-op program. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so it's, it's funny that you mentioned the, uh, the six month thing. I, I you mm. know, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. I, I spoke with, uh, Jeff Lewis, who's, uh, you know, founder and, uh, partner at, uh, at Bedrock Capital yesterday. Mm. And he, was, he was at Founders Fund with, with Teal previously. And, Mm. He talked about how his process was like six months and, and totally unusual. So I guess that's a, uh, a common thread probably across all of Teal's organizations. And you talked about the enduring, uh, you know, the focus on like enduring mm. businesses earlier. I forgot to mention that sort of, uh, yeah. you know, resonated with me as I, I know I've read from, from Teal on, on sort of the value of finding um, the last mover as opposed to the first mm. mover in, in an industry. And uh, these enduring qualities are sort of what makes that sort of come to fruition. Um, so then I, yeah. I'm not going to let you quite off the hook on the second piece yeah. about energy. What, what do you find sort of in, you know, whether it, it doesn't have to be like big stuff, but just uh, mm. in, in your day to day, what uh, sort of like adds energy? What do you yeah. feel is like really value, valuable activity for you versus things that you sort of have to do, but sort of wish you could either outsource or automate? Yeah, totally. Um, so I guess kind of answering like part 1A of that, Um, things that give me energy, um, I have a lot of building energy inside of me. Um, I think it's like a hangover from being like a product manager and, um, anything that's an outlet for that building energy gives me a lot of energy. So let me give you a few examples. Um, we've invested a fair amount in our stack, our workflows and our automations at weekend fund. And I actually take a lot of pride um, in that we are a two person distributed team and how we spend our time will become the returns of our fund, but even more critically, they'll become our reputation. And because we don't have people, we can't throw people at problems, which I like, which I think is like definitely tempting if you do have resources. The other thing is um, on the work side, we run what we call experiments, but also related. So both me, but also my boss and my only teammate, Ryan, he has a product background as well. He started off his career as a PM in the gaming biz before he started Product Hunt. And we have like a very similar worldview in that like we want to, be at like the edges of venture capital in a way and like innovating on the venture capital model. Um, There's been so little innovation. It's like the product manager's dream. You can almost like try anything as long as you're willing to be wrong. Um, Again, let me give you a few examples. So uh, we started running a series of experiments starting in the fall of 2019. Uh, The first of these was called Weekend Build. It was an ultra lightweight accelerator to help uh, side project builders turn their side projects into companies. And I can talk more about that if you're curious. Um, But yeah, we've continued to run experiments like that and brainstorming those experiments with Ryan, uh, executing, learning from them and iterating on them, I'd say gives me like a tremendous amount of energy. Um, I at least spend maybe like 20, 30% of my time on this. And if I was in like a pure 100% investing role, I would just get like far less um, out of the job. I love investing. It also gives me energy, but just like also being able to like, you know, like keep that like product, keep using that product muscle, um, I think like makes this role that I have at Weekend Fund just like like a bang on fit for like what I want. I like what I, how I want to spend my time. And in terms of what takes away my energy, um, that's a really good question. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, I have like some like, like fairly inconsequential stuff, but I hate doing like a life admin I think it's like harder for me than it is like for most people. Um, But 
Yeah, you know, I'm trying to think about like what else like kind of takes away my energy. Oh, here's one. Um, so before I joined, um, before I joined Weekend Fund, I I didn't really realize like venture capital had a culture around like jumping on calls with people and like trading deal flow um, with them. And it's a very relationship driven business. And I think there's definitely tremendous value in building those relationships. But like often those calls can feel a bit transactional to me. Like to me, like if I jump on a call with someone, like I'm like, you are not equal to the deal flow you could supply me, right? Like you're so much like bigger than that. Like, and I really want to get into like who you actually are. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I'm trying to not do um, as much of that anymore because I don't, I I don't leave these calls like feeling energized. Um, I often leave these calls like feeling just a bit hollow, to be honest. Yeah. It's sort of like a, uh, it's just a, not not a very like sincere conversation i imagine not that it's like you know n- nothing uh you know evil or, or anything yeah. going on but it's just like you said i think transactional and it's like well maybe we can just like fire off an email with a few deals that we're doing and and spend yeah. one minute on that and then maybe catch up for 30 minutes to sort of actually build a relationship and maybe that's actually a better use of of 30 minutes of time like a one minute email and a 20 minute conversation or whatever it is um uh- so yeah, that. I th- yeah. To your point, that's that's a. I think that's a, like a really good kind of solution to the problem. I've thought a little bit about like what makes it feel hollow, and I think there's like actually it's really efficient for both parties if both parties are really upfront, right, from what they want on about what they want from like an exchange. It saves a lot of time, and I do really appreciate that. But I think what makes this like feel hollow is that like it's like the marketing makes it like seem like it's like a get to know you call. But when you're actually on it, it's not really a get to know you call. Right. If yeah. that makes sense. Like you could just say like, hey, like let's jump on a call and just jam out on deals. And it yeah. wouldn't feel, you wouldn't leave the call feeling hollow, I don't think. Yeah, there's uh, like probably, I, I don't really get like easily bothered, but uh, but the couple of things that sort of uh, are maybe like pet peeves for me are, are people who are just like, uh, you know, not, not that people are this way all the time, but when people are, uh, sort of just not transparent, uh, and sort of have like, you know, that it's, it's like, uh, it's presented as being one thing, but it's, it's really another thing. And then Mm. totally unrelated, which sounds sort of relevant here. And and then another thing is not related at all, but just when people sort of refuse to be reasonable, I I have a lot of trouble, uh, sort of engaging, uh, past Mm. a certain point, but, uh, let's talk about a couple of the projects that you mentioned. Um, well, well, you mentioned one of them and I sort of noted another one for the conversation. One yeah, was, sure. uh, that you mentioned was the weekend build projects. Curious mm. to hear a little bit about that. You described it as like a lightweight accelerator. And then the second one, which I'd actually, I actually, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, still going on or, or whatnot, but even if it's not, uh, these mm-hmm. things are, are obviously good, like learning experiences. I'd love yeah. to hear about the fundraise from home thing that you guys were doing. Yeah. Uh, cause that's yeah. pretty interesting and, and like, a immediately, you know, shifted to remote world you guys reacted really quickly and said, let's do these remote pitches. And I'd love to hear how that went. Yeah, totally. So let's start with Weekend Build. Uh, The thinking there was, um, so it's becoming easier than ever to start a company. And uh, we thought side project builders were really underserved by the traditional venture capital market, but had a lot of the raw materials that you need to start a business. Uh, Like more specifically, if you're building a side project, you're likely solving a problem that you yourself are experienced because why would you be building something when, you know, your friends are out partying? Like that doesn't make sense. Also, you can probably build it yourself. Uh, Very few people can afford to hire someone or think it's a good use of their money to hire someone for a side project. Um, and a couple of um, other things that made us think that side project builders were actually like a really good user uh, to build for. Um, and the reason I'm kind of using user as like the like framing here is because we do think of these as like mini products. And um, what, what was, I think, most valuable, uh, we for like these site project builders was community. So we jump on these standups 
uh, every Sunday, we have 10 teams of side project builders uh, join us on like a Google Hangout um, from all around the world. And we'd go around the uh, we, we would go around the room and every builder would talk about what's been hardest or most challenging for them that week in their project. And then we would open it up to the group to problem solve. Um, and the idea behind this is um, it might be the first time a particular founder or builder is running into a problem. It's very unlikely that it's the first time this like group of 10 people or you can even do smaller groups and we do smaller groups um, with our regular weekend fund founders. Um, and I think it definitely has like the same impact. And um, when we did an anonymous survey, what builders told us is what they loved was like the community. Uh, when you're building a side project, right, you're not really being paid for it. Um, but also you're not really being like seen for it. If that makes sense, you're not being like recognized for it. And just like bringing in that community, I think was huge uh, for them. Ultimately, though, um, our biggest learning was around momentum. Um, it is obvious in hindsight, but really wasn't obvious to us when we were going into this. The longer a, someone was working on a side project, like the more impressive the kind of progress metrics would seem, seem when we actually um, interviewed them and like reviewed their application. But it's also like side project, I think like, they can, um, let me figure out how to phrase this, but basically like the longer you're working on something and you haven't actually quit to like, you know, make it your full-time thing, like why haven't you quit to make it your full-time thing? Mm. So there was like a little bit of like adverse selection there uh, we thought, which is why we decided transparently not to do like um, another version of weekend build uh, specifically, but so many of the learnings from Weekend Build have like inspired future experiments. And we're going to continue exper experimenting in Weekend Fund 3, which is like the fund that we are raising for now. Um, and I'm, yeah, it's, it was very, like, it was a very valuable experience uh, overall. And I don't think we could have like simulated those learnings any other way, except by actually like running the thing. Yeah, that makes sense. I think uh, I think I I'm optimistic about sort of if you guys keep running these experiments, mm. finding something that you can you know double and triple down on when it's working. And uh, yeah. to your point earlier, VC is like not that innovative. Angelist is doing a few things, which obviously you guys are intimately familiar with, given yeah. uh, the product hunt relationship. But uh, outside of that, it it's been pretty stagnant in terms of like you know a uh, a uh, ask you know an investor class that sort of uh invests in innovation you you would expect a little bit more innovation maybe mm -hmm. but uh but that's not sort of how things have unfolded thus far so curious to hear how uh future mm. experiments go and uh and you know see see what ends up sticking for you guys um yeah I want to go back to your to your story a little bit um you mentioned that well so first i think you had this experience at stripe uh free to talk about any sort of uh, takeaways from there, mm -hmm. although, although you don't have to. Uh, I'm actually yeah. more interested in hearing about um, you took, I think it sounded like a gap year, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm a huge proponent of the gap year. Took one myself, uh, was more or less on one, like up until, you know, basically am on one uh, right now and just mm. sort of doing, doing these things that I'm enjoying. Um, but curious to hear sort of what that gap year did for you. Maybe it, it was somewhat mm. inconsequential, but I'm curious if there's anything that sort of came out of it that, you know, you, you went into it one way and came out of it another way. And it's sort of a, like a before and after type of thing. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we're completely aligned and like the value of gap years. Um, let me answer the Stripe question very quickly. So I think my favorite part of working at Stripe was um, like a lot of high growth startups hire smart people. But what I've like realized kind of, you know, being on the inside is unless these people are generous to teach others, you never really interface with their thinking process. And like my favorite thing about Stripe is it had a very generous culture of teaching internally. 
So like, you know, strikes norms about transparency, strikes norms about writing, strikes norms about documentation, all of that resulted in like a culture where you could really learn like from the, from the best parts of everybody else. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, what was the next part? Oh yes, gap year, let me get into that. So uh, definitely the best thing um, I've done for myself professionally, which is very counterintuitive. And um, the reason for that was, so I took my gap year um, a bit like all around the world, but I started in Bangalore. So at my parents back home and it was very freeing. I think for me, it was like, awkward at first, but ultimately very freeing to be in a place where all of the things that validated me like back in the valley, like no one actually gave a shit about them back home, right? Like no, like an auto drive, auto rickshaw driver in India doesn't like necessarily care that Stripe is growing the GDP huh. of the internet, right? Like if you're going to be interesting in that conversation, you're going to be interesting on your own merit. And the same things that like validate you, I think also limit you. So I think it was really like freeing for me to like step back uh, from that. But yeah, it wasn't like, it was really awkward at first because I'd go to like, you know, so social events and people would be like, are you studying? And I'd be like, no. And they'd be like, are you working? And I'd be like, no. And then they'd be like, okay, are you at least applying for a job? And I'd be like, nope. And then they just like give up. Like you just see like the, like, you know, they're like checking out in their eyes. Um, but yeah, I just, honestly, I hung out a lot with my family and my extended family. Um, was surrounded by like a lot of love. Um, it was probably the least productive time of my life ever. That just like wasn't the point at all. There were like weeks that I just like did nothing at all, which like makes like the current me just like shudder. I'm just like, what, like, what was I doing? But that was the point. Like I was just doing nothing. Um, but I was reading a lot of books. I had like, um, a membership at like a maker space in Bangalore and learn to like start like cutting like acrylics using like an acrylic cutting machine that they had there and started like making these like really like unesthetic lamps uh let me say and yeah I just went on all of these like curiosity trips um yeah it was a had like an intense like romantic relationship as well at the time, which like was definitely time consuming. But then again, I really had the time to be consumed. Uh, so it wasn't, wasn't really like, um, wasn't really unproductive because I wasn't trying to be uh, productive. But I think I really came out on the other side, being able to be far more like intentional about the things that like I did want to validate me. Yeah, there, there's a few things there that definitely resonate with me. One is uh, sort of the just getting off of the hamster wheel almost. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was my first one I did was during school. And so mm. it was like seeing all my friends moving on to the next year of school and me just sort of dropping out and seeing like, oh, there's actually like a little bit of a different way to do this. And mm. I, I can go back to school, but I don't maybe have to. And uh, it's just mm. very interesting. And the same thing obviously applies when you're in, you know, tech industry or whatever sort of path you're on just to sort of step out of it for a second and realize like there's this whole world going on and the, the way that you're sort of been thinking is just a very narrow sort of aspect of everything. Um, mm. And then the other thing was the, uh, you know, the lack of productivity. I think there's sort of productivity has sort of like a, uh, you know, it's, it's like not a great word or, or I don't know exactly how to say this, but basically there's this obsession, especially in like tech and entrepreneurship and startups with sort of productivity, but productivity towards sort of a, uh, you know, a goal that's not worth accomplishing is actually counterproductivity from my point mm. of view. And so taking mm -hmm. a year off and sort of coming back more intentional, I think you said, is like, maybe doing nothing for a period of time is actually in the long run, the most productive thing you could have done, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think there's something to be said for like a lot of these things. And there's a couple other aspects of, of your story that uh, definitely resonated from my own experience. Oh, oh the, uh, 
Mm. Be like being at a you know a cocktail party or or, a, a <laughs> yeah. coffee or or whatever and people are like trying to figure out what you're doing and the best part is when they say like so what are you looking to do and it's like oh i'm not applying <laughs> and that that's when they really uh, yeah. get, get the glaze over but it's actually i think it's valuable to sort of become comfortable with being different um mm. and then you sort of have more of an inclination and, and less of a fear of, of doing things that are different in the future, which I think is always, always helpful as well. Um, so past that, you come back, you work for true layer to, mm. you know, from like six to a hundred employees. I think you said in a couple of years, yeah. what did yeah. you sort of learn? What, what was like the, you know, exciting parts, but also like really challenging parts of scaling a company so quickly. Yeah. Um, the, I think the excite, the most exciting part to me about scaling a company so quickly was just like, you, you have like this certain kind of like off the charts type of energy when things are growing really quickly. And it's actually like very hard to replicate. Like, do you know, like the energy of watching like an event live, like a sports event, like yeah. like days in the office felt like that often and it's really hard to have that like anywhere else I think um or at least in like my limited experience there are probably other jobs that can create that as well the hardest thing about scaling a business that quickly is not losing focus and like the I think the like an anti-pattern here is basically like you start off having no resources right and like that's a forcing function for focus and then maybe like you raise some money or like revenue start growing and then you are able to get more resources and then you actually like let the org focus shift away from like the most important thing, which of course is like servicing your customers. Sometimes you can even like lose sight of who the customer is completely. And you start like hiring for roles that are like a lot more like solving problems that you are creating internally as a result of scaling right but actually have like like the customer like doesn't really care about like all of these things that you like you're doing internally and it's very it's very hard just like maintaining that focus um it requires like a very consistent like you know like retelling of like this is why we're here like this is our mission Right. Like when they're competing priorities, like this is a compass we're actually going to use to to make decisions. Right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And it, it must just be a you know, I, I'm sure it's very helpful to sort of draw on that experience as an investor now, um, yeah. and sort of working with with founders and being able to speak from experience when it comes to growing a company basically from scratch to uh, mm. you know, a sizable organization. Uh, the way that you sort of landed in the position that you're in today mm. is pretty interesting. You sort of took it upon yourself to start writing these investment memos. And, and I know you mentioned like, um, you know, you got connected to, to Ryan and sort of a couple things went in your favor, but I'm always sort of of the belief that you sort of, uh, there's, there's a blind luck component, but you also make your own luck to some degree. And mm. by putting yourself out there in public with these investment memos, you sort of gave yourself that, uh, you know, maybe like a little, you, you worked in public enough where people could have something to look at and, uh, mm. and sort of you got the reps in to sort of get familiar with, with doing these sorts of evaluations. Um, I know, I think you mentioned in the past, like sort of a fake it till you make it mentality, which I think is, you know, maybe, maybe should be reworded. It, it sounds sort of negative, <laughs> but I think it's actually like a really useful strategy and a good one and nothing wrong with it. Uh, mm. So how did you sort of think about that when you like realized that, Hey, I can do this thing on the side and maybe that'll get me to where I want to go. Yeah. I wonder, like, I, I agree with you, like the fake it till you make it almost has like a negative perception around like you're not paying your dues. Like, is that what you mean? Unlike the kind of maybe negative like interpretation of well, that. I think fake is just a negative word. It's uh, basically, right. basically mm. like, um, you know, act the part until you have the part might be like a better a better way to like a less mm. you know, a more neutral way to say it and, and fake it till you make it's fine. Uh, I, I don't really <laughs> yeah. care too much. I'm, I'm still happy to do it regardless of what people call it. But, uh, 
But I think that uh, you certainly exemplified that and sort of <laughs> calling yourself an investor before you became one. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So um, I can kind of get, get into the, my thinking uh, behind that. Um, but basically, my I had this like idea that the internet should make it easier for you to start doing the work you want to do with that permission. And I, I was like, okay, so I want to get into investing and okay, like, I, I'm not really like no one right now is really giving me permission to start doing this work. But like, theoretically, I should be able to start doing the work. So like, how do I actually go about that? And I try to break down the investing job into its big buckets of work, right? So um, that would be sourcing. So finding companies you um, think are promising, uh, diligence, figuring out if you want to invest in these companies. And then there's a lot that happens around like sales. Um, So actually convincing the company to take your money. Um, And of course, portfolio support, which is being like the best possible partner that you can be to your company. And then there's also like the LP side of things, which is really important, but we just wasn't relevant um, for this like fake it as you make it exercise. So I broke down the job into like its big buckets of work. And then I was like, okay, what is going to be my like foothold into this? Like, what can I actually start doing today? Um, I didn't have access. I did not have uh, meaningful capital. And uh, I obviously like did not have like, you know, like relate, like a lot of relationship with like founders or like LPs. Uh, so anything that involved like that, those relationships were not an option. Uh, but what was an option I, I figured was like diligence, because like a lot of these, um, a lot of these rounds did get announced publicly in tech media. But um, the reasoning behind them was like, there were parts of it that were shared, right? Like on fun portfolio pages, but I could probably learn a lot by also like trying to like reverse engineer that like diligence process myself. So I started doing that. And I was honestly very shy about sharing these like investment memos at first. Um, A lot of it was like a misguided sense of like, you know, people will actually care if these are, if this is bad, of course, nobody actually cares about like your work being bad because like people don't usually care about your work as much as that you think they do. Um, And I started, I sent it to my brother and I started sending it to a few friends. Right. But um, one of the, I think the goal here is to like send it to um, people who are like insiders in, in the, thing that you're trying to break into. Um, Maybe like another thing that wasn't obvious to me when I started doing this, but is obvious in hindsight is like, you wanna share it more with like juniors and peers of the position that you wanna enter, not like, you know, people at like the top. You wanna share it with like the people who've not yet arrived in a way, not people who've like already made it. It's just like way easier to start building those relationships. And I, in, I think in a lot of ways, like more rewarding because you can grow alongside these people if you are able to build these relationships and you basically, and this is like the hardest part. You basically have to keep going until you get lucky. And I like, I speak from like a position of like ultimate privilege because it just so happened that like Harry Stabbings was my first friend in London. My brother connected me to Harry through Twitter and Harry is extremely connected and my now boss Ryan is extremely connected and they're connected to each other, which is how I ended up getting recommended from the job. Um, If you obviously like, if you're not coming from that position of privilege, like it's definitely gonna be more friction. So it's gonna require even more self-belief, but you have have just have like an irrational amount of like self-belief to just like, you just have to keep going basically um until you until you get lucky and i yeah i just got lucky with yeah, with weekend I, fund connection i love what you said about sort of uh you know in the first instance sort of recognizing that it's a much more permissionless world now with the internet uh mm. second that you know despite initial reservations about sharing 
no one actually cares. I think that's like yeah. a, great, a great realization that I sort of had uh, early on before the podcast, even when I was just writing and, and posting on my blog yeah. online, it's like, no one cares. So just like, you know, and, and granted, you can sort of run into trouble if you like write the wrong thing or whatever with like cancel culture and everything like that. But I figured, let me just flood them with way more than they can possibly handle. And then uh, if they want to pick out a piece, like, you know, that's, that's probably not, uh, it's obviously not representative of like the whole of me. And, and I can at least reasonably justify why like that's uh you know there's no problem sharing so so for me I, I sort of just dumbed down the mm. risk of like that fear of like what what are people going to think or, or whatever it might be and then lastly like I think it's important you know you talked about how how lucky you might have been but like I sort of have said I, I think you do mm. you can pe- people tend to underestimate and of course it's like you know a humble thing to say but I think people underestimate how much you can make your own luck and I think it's important mm. because some people just wait around sort of hoping that luck strikes them but there's things that you can do and so um you know being like quite relationship focused and and outgoing i think is one thing that you did and then doing this permissionless thing of of starting and uh drafting these memos and and reaching out to investors and yeah uh, you know it's not actually from my view super lucky that you sort of had this connection and and got this role um Mm. i think you did all the right things and sort of found the luck and it was sort of due to come with all the persistence. So I think it's just, it's nice to hear people sort of be humble and talk about how they got lucky and things. But I think for me, actually, at least, and like you can, you know, say, say that I'm wrong or something, but uh, mm. I think it's helpful to sort of share that message that there are things that you can do yeah. because people just sitting around waiting for blind luck is, is not going to end well, I think for a lot of people. Yeah, totally. Um, I read this on someone's blog. It may have been Sam Altman's blog or either um, Sam Altman's blog or uh, P. Marka's career to, um, sorry, P. Marka's guide to career planning um, on Mark and Dreesen's blog. Mm -hmm. Um, But they talk about how like the world is far more malleable than most people think. And you can like bend it to your will um more than like you ever think it is but you still have to like expect to get rejected a lot um this is funny but like when I first started sending out these investment memos I would send it to like my mom right like my dad my brother and because like it was important for me to like get that like initial like validation of course they had like no expertise like to actually tell me if these investment memos are not, and they probably wouldn't tell me the truth anyway, because they love me. Um, but I think when it, when you are starting off, like, you know, doing something new, like more, some people are more intrinsically motivated than others, but I, I find it hard to believe that like, you can be a hundred percent intrinsically motivated, right? Like, I think it, it really does go like a long way to have, other people like see your work as good um so I think like as you build more confidence though you actually start sharing that work with like people with more expertise because they will start giving you very honest feedback and that feedback will actually kickstart this like improvement cycle so I think like the ordering really matters yeah I think I I understand what you're saying. And I, and I think I agree, which is basically like you, there's an element of intrinsic motivation where you want to do something sort of, because yeah. you're, you're self-driven to do it, but then yeah. you start quickly sort of layering on these other elements because the intrinsic motivation will only sort of take you so far. Is that, is that somewhat right? Yeah, that's, that's somewhat right. But also like there is this entire movement around like building in public, right? But the thing is, the challenge is that when you when you are obscure, right, when nobody actually cares about the work that you're doing, you can build in public, right? But like people likely will still not care about the work that you're doing. And I think in those early days, it's actually really important, I think, to share with the people that like who love you. It won't help. It won't help improve your work. But I think it does help emotionally in that like you're being seen for doing that work. And as you build more confidence over time, you can start sharing with more and more people who can actually give you like um, meaningful feedback about the work. 
And these like audiences have like different purposes, right? Like, like your friends and family basically like help you feel like safe doing the work. Whereas like, you know, peers, um, other more accomplished people in the field, they help you improve your work and you need both, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think just the, uh, the sort of basic human need of, of sort of being recognized from time to time is something that there's, there's very few characteristics that are like across every person, but I think that's probably one of the more mm. prevalent ones just to sort of, you know, everyone wants, everyone wants to have a, like a purpose or feel needed or, or whatever the, the right word is. And, and just getting recognition doesn't need to be like a huge amount all the time, but yeah. once in a while that something that you're doing is sort of uh, you know, meaningful in some small way at, at the very least is is a, a key aspect. And I also liked what you said about sort of, uh, I have to check out the Altman and uh, mm. Andreessen posts. I actually haven't read either, but um, but I, I like both of those people. Mm. And, uh, and it reminds me of uh, a Steve Jobs quote I like a lot. I, I don't want to butcher it, but basically mm. it's something along the lines of like, uh, you know, he had an important realization that the world was built by people no smarter than him and mm. he could change it and he could make it, you know, better in, in the ways that he wanted. And, and again, I might've butchered that a little bit, but mm. um, it's an important realization because the world just seems so complex and it, it seems like everything's happening to you, but you can mm. start to sort of view things as happening for you and start to change the way that things are actually happening. If you sort of, uh, you know, start to think that you might be able to and, and take action on it. So uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Thanks uh, for sharing that. And, you know, the thing I've always thought about quotes like that and like the more like inspirational quotes, it's like it doesn't matter if it's true because like it's still valuable for you to have that worldview because that's what causes you to act, right? Like the story you want to believe is the story that makes you take action. Yeah, 100%. Even if actually, it's not true. Yeah, I think about that a lot, actually. Uh, like another example is sort of everything happens for a reason, actually mm. very, very related. But um, yeah, yeah. the way I think about it is, you know, um, if it's true, then like, great, I believe in, in something that's true. And if it's not, then I'm still sort of looking to make the best of things and, and yeah. take sort of adverse circumstances and think like, how can I make this, you know, something that I'm, I'm grateful for in the long run, something mm. that worked for me. And uh, so I, I totally agree with your point on sort of truth being, you know, some people w might argue and uh, maybe reasonably so, but I think in, in some instances, truth is maybe not the most important thing. It's just like what works for you on, on an individual level. Yeah, totally. So anyway, we've, we've gone on a bit of a tangent and, and way, <laughs> o way, way over time. So uh, I, I appreciate you doing that. And uh, I, I do want to wrap things up for, for yeah. the sake of, uh, respecting your time, but uh, where can people go and, and follow you? Uh, you know, on Twitter or uh, follow the weekend fund uh, would love for you to share. And, you know, second to that, and most importantly, thank you again very much for, for taking the time. It's, it's been a real pleasure talking with you. Yeah. Likewise, this has been uh, a blast. I felt like I really got into the flow of a conversation with you, which I think is a really good sign, but I'm um, on Twitter at uh, Vedika, so V-E-D-I-K-A-J-A -A underscore I-N. And uh, you can find Weekend Fund at weekend.fund.